to call if the fruit is fame Only give it all if they know my name Only want things to grow, but do I want you to grow me? Investigate, investigate my heart Investigate, investigate my heart Investigate, investigate my heart Investigate, investigate
Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Seaside. My name's Larry. As you guys are having a seat, junior hires head out to the junior high lot. All right, a reminder, or if you're visiting with us uh, right behind the sound booth, there's one restroom and there's two restrooms down the hallway uh, on the other side of the kitchen there as well. Um, I'm right by the front door inside and right outside the tent. There's a round table offering box on it and right next to the offering box, our prayer cards. And so if you fill out a prayer request and drop it in the offering box, it will get sent out to our entire prayer team. So please take advantage of that part of our prayer ministry, if you would, please. Well, a couple of things really exciting. Well, this last, yesterday was just an amazing day. Bob Tripp, who shared uh, his testimony with the men. We had a great turnout of over 40 guys here for breakfast. Bob, thank you. That was, uh, it was a really powerful morning and just to for then afterwards for guys to re reflect on what God's doing and how God's working in each of our lives. So that was awesome. Thank you. And this Friday, uh, once a month uh, during the school year, our high school ministry does, it's called Friday Free Lunch. And if you happen to be available right around 12, 15, it's awesome to come watch all these high schoolers. They have to, some of them run from Edison because they have such a short uh, lunch break. And we feed them lunch and it's just a great opportunity uh, to see them, and some of them have, you know, never really been part of our church, but they, they're happy to come for a free lunch, and we're happy that they do. So uh, it's a really awesome outreach, and we're so thankful. Mindy Marcus does a lot of all of the organizing of it. So um, if you'd like to get involved on a semi-regular basis, you can talk to Mindy or talk to me, and I'll direct you that way as well. And then this weekend is also our junior high camp, and so our junior high will be here Saturday morning, and uh, then heading out to uh, Idlewild for their, their winter camp. And so we're excited for that. Pray for our junior hires. Pray for the leaders that uh, God will use them in a powerful way to just, just stir the hearts of our junior high students. And then the last thing that's coming up pretty quick here is our 28th anniversary as a church. So we are going to have... I should sing this announcement because we're going to have a party, karaoke, we're going to have Uno, we're going to have Farkle, all kinds of games, pizza and salad, and just a great time for the whole family. So uh, that is the 20, uh, the, the, what's the date? The 25th, sorry, Sunday, the 25th at 5 o'clock, and we're really excited to just to celebrate, get together, have fun, and encourage one another in the Lord. And then today we're going to be praying for Calvary Baptist Church. And um, Calvary Baptist, the, the pastor there, Pat Cottrell, former pastor there, retired uh, at the end of this year. And uh, Lucas Parks is the new pastor. And John and I have had a, a great chance to get to know Lucas. And he's a wonderful guy. Um, he happens to be in Ireland right now because they lived there for a number of years. And uh, anyways, we're going to pray for Calvary Baptist uh, the, the Lord is doing amazing things through that church, and they're such an important part of our community here. Uh, they're the ones that host community Bible study for, uh, on two, uh, Thursday mornings and Thursday evenings, and it's just a, uh, an amazing church that's been around Huntington for quite a while. So we're going to pray for ourselves. We're going to pray for Calvary Baptist, and if you guys will stand and allow me the privilege of leading you in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all that you're doing the way you're working around this community today and around the world as well as people gather in your name. And we lift up Calvary Baptist and, and uh, the work that's going on there. We pray for pa Pastor Lucas, Lord, that you would uh, continue to just embed him deeply in that church family. And I thank you, God, for all the ways that Calvary Baptist is a blessing to our community. And Lord, we ask that today the Holy Spirit would speak uh, there through the message that people's hearts would be stirred. And Lord, we pray that for ourselves, Lord. As John brings the message, may your word just spark life within us because your word is alive and living and we want it. We want to be impacted by the power of your word. Amen. And as we sing our songs of praise, Lord, may you be honored. And as we fellowship, may that also be an encouragement to one another and also a worship to you. 
We love you, God, and we thank you for this time. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. amen.
thank you, Lord, that, that we have a friend in Jesus, that you are gracious, that you are full of good grace, that you are a God that delights in us, that even when we woke this morning, you were singing praise even over us. And I just pray that even as your word is spoken this morning, that it would really just open our hearts to you and what it is and the work that you're doing in each of us. In your precious name we pray, amen. You can have a seat. A little premature. You're supposed to greet each other before you have a seat. So stand up and greet one another real quick and then have a seat. Come on. <laughs> Do me a favor. I don't know. He, he, uh, he's doing good. Yeah. He's just get, trying to get retired from his carpet business. Okay. And uh, he's driving the buses and he's doing it. Oh, okay. Yeah. 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 I, I just remember him. We did a. I, I helped him out on a few jobs. And I just. Yeah, oh, he's doing really good. But it's good. really good to see you. Yeah, you too. Yeah. Been, your family's always been a blessing. <laughs> Thank you. I want to say hi to Ralph. Yeah. Okay, that was good. Well, this is a very special uh, Sunday. It's Super Bowl Sunday. And uh, it's also Valentine's Sunday. And I'm looking at some of you guys are just like, I, I don't care about either one of those, so you better get with the program. Um, I don't know if you're for Kansas City Chiefs today or for the four, couple people, for the 49ers. So how many of you are for Taylor Swift? A few honest people, good. There you go. Well, we're going to get in. Um, <laughs> this is great. My wonderful, beautiful wife, before she went up to the nursery today, instead of saying, God, John, I'm praying for you, have a great sermon, she said, John, don't talk too long. I'm up here with the kids. <laughs> so pressure is on right now here. Let's pray and we'll get going. Thanks, Father, for your word. Thank you for this beautiful day that we gather together in the name of Christ. Thanking you for your presence here with us. Your grace and your mercy overwhelm us. You are good. So we ask that you would speak to us through your word today. In the name of Christ and everybody said... Very hearty. Amen. So today we are in Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 2. And a couple weeks ago, my good brother Mike um, uh, introduced this book. And he went into a lot of background back in Genesis. And I'm going to do that not to add on to Mike because he that was awesome. But to tie in a couple little details about today. I want to kind of go back a little bit and um, just look at some background before we uh, hit this um, chapter today. Uh, last week, Jimmy uh, introduced the book, uh, the actual chapter one and half of chapter two, talking about this wonderful woman by the name of Hannah who was praying to the Lord for a child and God answers her prayer. And uh, we'll get to that in a moment. But I want to talk today about uh, mudslides. Um, this, since January, there have been reported about 950, at least 950 pretty major mudslides in, just in California. Some of them have just been devastating to properties and everything else. But I was thinking about mudslides and, uh, man, that's nasty, ugly, clean up, mud just sticks to your shoes, it's just hard to walk through it, it's destructive, 
And uh, when I was thinking about mudslides, I was thinking about the Bible and the history in which we are looking at right now could be described as just one ginormous, <laughs> ugly mudslide. There's a lot of mess going on in the Bible. I grew up in church, and I love my, uh, everything I learned. But I grew up in Sunday school where you had flannel graphs, you know. Does anybody know what a flannel graph even is? You know, where they have these little characters. And um, basically, you know, you learn about Bible characters. But then when you become an adult and you really start reading the Bible, it's like, oh, my, that's in the book. It is just one mudslide after another. There are some things that you can't even really read to your children. It's just like, oh, well, I have to edit this one, uh, the, these characters. But you read like the book of Genesis, and it's just one giant mudslide. And I want to just share this because there might be some people in here today that are not familiar with the Bible, and it's kind of new to you. And so we want to help you understand where we are in the Bible, okay? So Mike did a great job going back to Genesis and talking about um, the call of Abraham. Abraham had a son by the name of Isaac. Uh, Isaac had two sons, uh, Esau and Jacob. Jacob, and Mike shared this, and go back and listen, it was just awesome, but Jacob was a deceiver. Man, he was a snake in the grass, man. That guy, not very... A lot, of, a lot of good, I mean, in his life initially, all right? Uh, Jacob was a swindler. Uh, he swindled his brother uh, Esau out of his birthright, out of his inheritance. And then he ran for his life to Uncle Laban, uh, where Abraham initially came from. And I have this graph up here just to kind of, just to give you an idea of Jacob, okay? So Jacob fell in love with a young lady by the name of Rachel. He loved Rachel so much that he went to Laban and asked for her hand in marriage. And Laban, who was also shrewd and deceptive, deceived the deceptive Jacob. Okay, he said, sure, I'll give you Rachel. Just, you know, let's cut a deal here. You work for me for seven years. Seven years of your life, and I'll give Rachel uh, for you as a wife. So the wedding day comes. A uh, lot of, had to have been a lot of wine drinking, celebration, uh, honeymoon suite. And Jacob wakes up in the morning, and behold, it wasn't Rachel. It was Rachel's older sister, Leah. And you could just, first of all, I, I just stop right there with this mudslide and go like, huh? You know, he's like, he could, what's going on there? You know, he wakes up in the morning to a woman that he thought he was married to Rachel, and then there's Leah. Um, and Jacob goes to Laban and says, look, man, what a deceptive thing. And she, uh, Laban's like, oh, man, you know, I, I can't just give you my youngest daughter first. That's... That's not customary. We, the oldest daughter gets married first. So work for me for another seven years, and then I'll give you Rachel as well. And you can have both of those beautiful daughters of mine. So here we go. Leah is, does that chart up there? You can see Leah uh, start off having four sons, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. And I want you to kind of just make a little mental note about these names because if you want to understand the Bible, you kind of need to know these are the 12 family sons, the tribes of Jacob or Israel, okay? And here's the mudslide. Rachel couldn't get pregnant, and so Rachel says, here, have my servant girl, Bilhah, and sleep with her, have sex with her, and she'll have babies for me. And so Jacob, I'm sure, just was like, oh, okay. And then he, he's, you know, goes to bed 
with Bilhah, the servant girl, and has Dan and Naphtali, right? Are you guys feeling the mudslide yet? Yeah. Leah starts wondering, like, I've stopped having babies. Well, you know, Jacob can be in one tent at one time. First of all, this whole thing gets really weird. And so Leah gives Jacob her servant girl, Zilpah, and so then Zilpah gets pregnant, and she has uh, sons seven and eight, Gad and Asher. And then Leah begins to conceive again and has son number nine, Issachar, number 10, Zebulun, and then they have a daughter by the name of Dinah. And then finally, Rachel, uh, God hears her prayers, and Rachel conceives, and she has a son uh, by the name of Joseph, and the end of Genesis is this giant mudslide of a family. Are you guys with me on this? I mean, Jimmy mentioned it last time. We come to Samuel, and we have this guy by the name of Elkanah who has two wives, and Jimmy goes, right off the bat, man, this is going to be an ugly story. I mean, it's, it's a mudslide, all right? So anyway, back to Jacob. The book of Genesis ends with Joseph um, being uh, in Egypt. God raises him up because his 10 older brothers hate him. They're jealous of him, and it's just a big mess. And then finally, the last son, Benjamin, is born uh, to Rachel, and she dies in childbirth. So there's this beautiful story of the book of Genesis. <laughs> Have fun reading that to their kids. To your children. Oh, by the way, if you go back to Judah, uh, Judah's two sons die. Uh, Tamar, the daughter-in-law, t- uh, dresses up like a prostitute and entices Judah to have sex with her. She gets. I mean, this is a giant mudslide of a story. It's sin and the repercussions of sin after the fall, and what happens to humanity is just unbelievable. And so Joseph has two sons. Uh, one of his sons is Ephraim, and the other is Manasseh. And so if you just keep a couple names in your mind, the name Judah, because when Jacob was blessing his sons, um, Reuben, the firstborn, does not get a big blessing. He goes, you're a curse. Because Reuben snuck in and had a sexual affair with Rachel's servant girl, Bilhah. Okay, so... Another story. But Levi is a name that you want to remember, especially for today's story, because Levi is chosen by God. He's, um, they bear sons. Moses and Aaron come from this family line of Levi, and they're the ones that get chosen for the priestly duties uh, in Israel. So the Bible goes on. Uh, in uh, Genesis ends, uh, the children of Israel are in Egypt. They're there for 400 years. Moses and Aaron are in the desert for 40 years. Uh, Exodus ends going into the book of Joshua, where Joshua comes in and he conquers the land. Um, and it takes about 27 years for that to happen. Um, There's a place that we want to talk about, Shiloh. When Joshua came into the land, they went uh, just kind of right into the center. And there's a little area, a little village actually called Shiloh. And that became the central headquarters for a while for the Israelites. It's where uh, the tabernacle was built on this little hillside in uh, Shiloh. It's where uh, Joshua delegated the land out to the Israelites, to all the tribes. And so we come to this time from, uh, from the Joseph story to our story here today. It's about 800 years have passed, okay? So just kind of have a little time frame of what's going on. We come to the book of Judges, which takes place over about 325 years. And the last verse of Judges is this. In those days, Israel had no king. Everyone did as they saw fit. 
in the ESV, it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. And as we can tell already from the story of Genesis, what people do, what's right in their own eyes, is called what? A mudslide, thank you. Uh, seriously, sinful mudslide. In the message it says, at that time there was no king in Israel. People did whatever they felt like doing. And so Judges ends about a 325-year period of time. It ends again with this more chaos, more upheaval, more mudslide, uh, more depravity. Okay, so we come to the book of Samuel, and um, as Jimmy introduced last week, we have this uh, woman by the name of Hannah. She's the bright light. Uh, if there's few characters in the Old Testament where it doesn't seem like there's a, a negative, you know, shadow cast, of, Hannah is one of them. Beautiful uh, character um, from what we can tell. And so Hannah has a child. God answers her prayer. And uh, she has a child, but calls him Samuel. And so we're in this story where she brings Samuel back to Shiloh, where the ta tabernacle, the tent of meeting is. And she dedicates this probably three to four year old son of hers and dedicates her back to the Lord. Okay? And so we're going to look at the second half of that chapter today. You guys hang with me for just another verse on background, okay? Here we go. Hear the story. Because what this, what this chapter is going to do right now, and I need you to understand this, it's telling us a story, but the author is trying to get us to think about the, the contrast of what's going on here, okay? We're going to look at the mudslide of the priestly line that's been happening, and then it's going to take us over to like, but here's what God's doing with Samuel, okay? And it's going to go back and forth, and it's just showing there's a contrast here. God, in the midst of the mudslide, in the midst of human sin, is alive and well, and he's working, and he's preparing this world for something far greater that's to come. And his name is Jesus, and I can't wait to get to that part of the story. Okay, so uh, a little more background in the book of Deuteronomy, just so we understand. So Aaron, a Levite, by the way, if you'll notice, again, if you're new to the Bible, you're like, who are all these ites, you know, termites, Levites, what? who are, <laughs> that goes back to those 12 sons of Jacob, okay? So the Levite. Tribe of Levi, Levites, all right? It's not a gene. All right, here we go. Um, Deuteronomy 18, it says this. Remember that the Levitical, or the tribe of Levi, priest, that is the whole of the tribe of Levi, will receive no allotment of land among the other tribes in Israel. Instead, the priests and Levites will eat from the special gifts given to the Lord for that is their share. They will have no land of their own among the Israelites. The Lord himself is their special possession, just as he promised them. These are the parts the priests may claim as their share from the cattle. Sheep and goats that the people bring as offerings. The Israelites we're told that there's five offerings, most of which are animal offerings, there's grain offerings, but God here is saying the priests get a part of this offering for their own. The goats, the people bring it as offerings, the shoulder, the cheeks, and the stomach. You must also give to the priest the first share of the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, and the wool as shearing time, at shearing time. For the Lord your God chose the tribe of Levi out of all your tribes to minister in the Lord's name forever. And so when the children of Israel were out in the desert and God gave the commands, he said, here's the tabernacle, this tent of meeting, and it was an elaborate setup where God was going to come and dwell with his people. And it was this line of Levi 
they took care of it. They're the ones that could carry the, uh, the ark. They're the ones that uh, cleaned the utensils, took care of everything concerning uh, the tabernacle and its furnishings. They didn't get any land, and they lived off of the, the sacrificial system that God put in place. And you can read about this. If you want to read about sacrifice, read about the first eight chapters of Leviticus. Go back to Exodus. There's a bunch there. So that being said, I hope that's enough being said about that. Uh, the Levites carry out all the duties. Uh, I put on, on your outline um, a little genealogy of the priests in David's time, and it would be helpful if you have some of these. You can just Google these beautiful little you know, charts that will just help you think about who's who and what's what in, in the Bible. So Aaron was Moses' older brother. Uh, God said Aaron. He was from the tribe of the line of Levi, okay? Uh, Aaron had two sons that died before God because they came into the tabernacle and they were not ministering as God told them that he wanted to, to, to minister. And fire came out from the altar and consumed his first two sons. Whew, that's dangerous business. Uh, Aaron had two more sons, uh, Eleazar, Ithamar, and on the right side, Ithamar, uh, and these aren't all the sons, but it's the line. So Eli, who we're going to be looking at today and throughout this first part of Samuel, Eli comes from uh, Ithamar. He has two sons, Hopni and Phinehas. And Phinehas has two sons, Ahitub and Ichabod, and great names if you're looking for baby names, uh, Ahijah, Ahimelech. Abiathar, uh, and Jonathan. And so we're going to see what happens with this side of the priestly line, okay? And on the left side from Eliezer, I just want you to remember the name Zadok, okay? Zadok. And so here we go. Let's get into the story. So Eli is the high priest. When Hannah came into the tabernacle to pray, Eli thought that she was a wicked woman. What are you doing? You're drunk. You're, what are you doing? You're, you're drunk. And Eli actually thought to himself that she is a wicked, like a son of Belial. Now, Eli's sons were scoundrels, and it's the exact same Hebrew word, okay? So what Eli was accusing Hannah of, his two sons were really the sons of Belial. They were scoundrels. I like that word. Um, they had no regard for the Lord. And now it was their, the practice of the priests that whenever any of the people offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come with a three-pronged fork in his hand. And while the meat was uh, being boiled and would plunge the fork into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot, whatever the fork brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is how they treated all the Israelites who came to Shiloh. So these guys, basically, um, as people were coming in, again, there were five uh, sa sacrificial uh, times, with five sacrifices that the Israelites would offer. And these two sons of Eli were scoundrels. And basically, instead of doing it how God prescribed, they were kind of just ripping the people off and the sacrifice off. I kind of got stuck on, you know, my brain. I, I just get stuck on certain things, and I thought, okay, what a big deal. You know, they plunged a fork into the meat, okay? It could have been a goat, a lamb, sometimes a bull. A bull's a pretty good-sized critter, okay? And so some of you might be thinking, like, hey, no big deal, you know, a little, a little taster, you know, not bad. Most of you might have just thought like, okay, regular, you know, adult fork. We'll get in there and eat. Um, how many of you guys have uh, a friend, a sibling, a spouse, someone who's always picking food off of everyone's plate as a... <laughs> this is the gift that you want to get to for that person right there. 
Have you seen these? This is beautiful. <laughs> Instead of reaching across the table, they can just like, oh yeah. <laughs> Ooh, that meatball looks good. And so this might be a tremendous Valentine's gift for your sweetie if you're married to one of those kind of people. Uh, maybe today some of you are, you know, grilling some tri-tip and you know, when you're thinking about a fork, you're like, yeah, you know, like, just get into that thing and have some fork. But probably the fork that's talked about here might be looking closer like this. I mean, those priests, they were on a serious keto diet, man, and like, they were like, oh, yeah, there's the bull. They would just stick it into the pot and dig it out. And they fed themselves. Eli was getting in on this extra grub because in a couple chapters, we're going to see that Eli was a very uh, obese man, and he dies because of it, okay? And we'll get to that. But these guys were scoundrels, and they were taking big parts of the sacrifice, and they were feeding themselves from the sacrifice. And God was like, man, that is not your call. That's not what you're supposed to. You're not representing me. And that's the title of this message today is these guys were meant to represent God. And they were not doing a great job of it. Um, let's go. Where am I? Okay, so they're in Shiloh, verse 15. But even before the fat was burned, so that in the sacrificial system, the fat was completely taken off of the animal and burned completely. Uh, the fat was, before the fat was burned, the priest's servant would come and say to the person who was sacrificing, give the priest some meat to roast. He won't accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. If the person said to him, let the fat be burned first, because that's what God prescribe for these sacrifices and then take whatever you want. And these two guys, these two priests said, um, no, hand it over now. If you don't, we'll take it by force. Verse 17, mark this verse. This sin of the young men was very great in the Lord's sight, for they were treating the Lord's offering with contempt. These guys were there to represent God. They were there to represent the people to God, represent God to the people. And they were not doing a great job. They were self-indulgent. They were just in this thing for themselves. And they did, had no consideration for what God was thinking. Now, here's the contrast, okay? I told you this chapter is about contrast. Verse 18. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord, a boy wearing a linen ephod. Each year his mother made him a little robe and took it to him when she went up with her husband to offer the annual sacrifice. Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife, saying, May the Lord give you children by this woman to take the place of the one she prayed for and gave to the Lord. And then they would go home. Verse 21, and the Lord was gracious to Hannah. She gave birth to three sons and two daughters. And meanwhile, the boy Samuel grew up in the presence of the Lord. So Hannah, this bright star in the story and the history of Israel, um, talks about her son Samuel. And I just circled this, this two words that Samuel grew up we're going to keep seeing references to Samuel growing up. And what we see in this chapter, again, is the contrast. You see the sons of Eli growing more and more wicked, and you see Samuel growing up more and more godly. Okay, here's the contrast. Verse 22, now Eli was very old, heard about everything his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they slept with the women who served at the entrance to this tent of meeting. So he said to them, why do you do such things? I hear from all the people about your wicked deeds, the, these wicked deeds of yours. 
No, my sons, the report I hear spreading among the Lord's people is not good. If one person sins against another, God may mediate for the offender. But if anyone sins against the Lord, who will intercede for them? His sons, however, did not listen to their father's rebuke, for it was the Lord's will to put them to death. Verse 26, another contrast. And the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and with people. Eli, his family, growing more wicked and disobedient. Samuel is saying this man is growing in stature and in favor with the Lord. Verse 27, now a man of God, this is interesting, he's unnamed. We don't know anything about this, this man of God. Uh, but take note of this. In the midst of the mudslide, God always has his people. He will always have a voice. He will always have a person. Even if they're unnamed, unfaced, they are there. This man, amen. Now a man of God came to Eli and said to him, This is what the Lord says. Did I not clearly reveal myself to your ancestors' family when they were in Egypt under Pharaoh? I chose your ancestor out of all the tribes of Israel, Levi, to be my priest, to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod in my presence. I also gave your ancestors' family all the food offerings presented by the Israelites. They were welcome to have a portion of every sacrifice made. It was enough for them. Why do you scorn, verse 29, why do you scorn my sacrifice and offering that I prescribe, prescribe for my dwelling? Why do you honor your sons more than me by fattening yourselves on the choice parts of every offering made by my people Israel? Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel, declares, I promise that members of your family would, member, would minister before me forever. But now, the Lord declares, far be it from me. Those who honor me, I will honor. Those who despise me will be disdained. The time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will reach old age. And you will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. Every one of you that I do not cut off from serving at my altar, I will spare only to destroy your sight and sap your strength. And all your descendants will die in the prime of life. I'm going to skip. Keep going here in verse 34. And what happens to your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, will be a sign to you. They will both die on the same day. I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house, and they will minister before my anointed one always. And then everyone left in your family line will come and bow down before him for a piece of silver and a loaf of bread and plead, appoint me to some priestly office so I can have food to eat. So God is saying, remember that little chart on this one line of, uh, that Eli comes from? Uh, God had made a promise to Aaron and his sons that their disobedience brings God to this place of, man, I am faithful that your line is going to be cut off and all of your descendants will not live to old age. And we're going to see this in Samuel uh, happening, okay? And the chapters ahead of us are going to be filled with some more mudslides, and this is part of it, is we're going to see uh, these descendants of Eli um, being killed. 
because God was very adamant that they were to represent him and represent him well. I was thinking about this prophecy that this man of God, he comes and he says, I'm going to raise up for myself a faithful priest. There's someone coming. Scholars are really uh, fascinating with, fascinated with this prophecy because as we're going to go through uh, Samuel, we're going to see uh, another, the, on the left side of that chart, from, we're going to see down this name of Zadok, okay? And he becomes a priest of David. And I believe that he is faithful, okay, to the Lord. But I think it's a bigger prophecy than that. I, I believe that this is shooting out way further than Samuel and Zadok and uh, all of that. I think and believe that the whole Old Testament and all these stories are pointing us to Jesus Christ and his coming into the world, okay? They're all, all this mudslide that we see is for us to realize mankind on our own. Oh my gosh, we're capable of the worst evils, right? And we need a savior. And that savior is coming. It's going to come through the line of Judah, through David, and, and on and on, okay? And so I believe that it's a prophecy pointing out further. But he says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. And I will firmly establish his priestly house and they will minister before my anointed one always. You come to the book of Hebrews uh, in the New Testament and there's uh, a number of chapters devoted to this idea that Jesus is our high priest, okay? He is the faithful high priest. I believe that this man of God is prophesying, yes, it's going to happen through Zadok, but even further and greater out is this coming Savior into our world. I picked up a couple of these passages out of Hebrews chapter 4. It says, So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same testings that we do, yet he did not sin. So let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. There we will receive his mercy, and we will find grace to help us when we need it. In chapter 5 of Hebrews, verse 1, it says, Every high priest is a man chosen Let's read this out loud. Chosen to uh, represent other people in their dealings with God. He presents their gifts to God and offers sacrifices for their sins. And he is able to deal gently with ignorant and wayward people because he himself is subject to the same weaknesses. That is why he must offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as theirs. And no one can come before a high priest simply because he wants such an honor. He must be called by God for this work, just as Aaron was. And so we see the book of Hebrews is pointing to Jesus and saying, He is the one. He is the perfect high priest. Amen. He's the one that not, didn't even have to offer sacrifices for his own sins as the high priest did in the Old Testament because he himself was without sin. And he himself offered himself as the ultimate sacrifice for the sin of the world. Amen. And that's beautiful. And that's what these stories are pointing us to, is something far greater than the immediate Samuel story. But here's where it comes in for us. Okay, everybody, man, get excited about this. Because how many of you uh, can trace your your lineage back to Aaron, and you've come from Aaron's line. Anybody please raise your hand. I'd like to see that. Um, but here's the deal. Here's what's happening spiritually in God's family. God has put a call on your life and my life to represent him as what? As a priest. As a priest. Here we go. Look at Peter. You are chosen people. 
a royal priesthood. Man, the priests got to wear some really fine clothes, man. They, they had the best underwear, this fine linen, uh, purple, blue garments, vests with big, beautiful stones on it. The high priest had this you know, vest that had each of the tribes of Israel engraved on their, uh, a rock and a big gold plate on their head. And, I mean, they were just, they were really dressed out fine. And he says, you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Praise be to Jesus. How do we represent? I want to, that, that's, these first chapters in Samuel, I kind of want to get out of them in a way and talk about us for a moment here. How do we represent? If we're priests and we represent God to our world, what's the world seeing? Okay, what do they see? We represent people to God. And we pray for people. We intercede for people, right? Jobs of priests, how we represent. First thing that comes to my mind is like these sons of Eli who were scoundrels, our goal and our heart is living to please God. We're living, I love an old phrase, and it's always just, man, it just captured my heart when I first heard it is learn to live for the audience of one. And when you do that, everything about life changes. What we do in secret changes. What we do changes. When I'm truly thinking and focused on living my life to honor the Lord. In verse 29, um, the man of God to Eli said, Why do you honor your sons more than me? And I think all of us should fill in the blank. Who would we honor above God? Or why would we not present ourselves as people, priests that want to please God and God alone and God first? I've lived to please friends, um, spouse, children, people at work. Man, when my heart changes and I realize, man, I'm a priest and I want to honor God above all else. I love verse 30 of this of chapter 2 of Samuel. He says, those who honor me, I will honor. But those who despise me will be disdained. When we put God's kingdom first, as Jesus taught us, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all other things will be added to you. Man, we just need that focus. This was Paul's prayer to the Colossian church. He said, so ever since we first heard about you, we have kept on praying and asking God to help you understand what he wants you to do, asking him to make you wise about spiritual things, and asking that the way you live will always please the Lord and honor him, so that you will always be doing good, kind things for others, while all the time you are learning to know God better and better. And that's out of the Living Bible. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, and 4, 1, it says, We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our heart. Finally, dear brothers and sisters, we urge you in the name of the Lord Jesus to live in a way that pleases God, as we have taught you. You live this way already, and we encourage you to do so more and more. Eli's sons, stand as a very stark example of people that just live for themselves. Hey, I want some more meat. I want more meat for my family. I want more of this. Uh, they're just, just a, an appetite that was just never, ever filled, an appetite of self-indulgence. And God says, man, we are a different kind of a priesthood. We represent him. We're living a different kind of life. Priests in the Old Testament, as I just mentioned, had a very elaborate uh, clothing that they put on. It was, I mean, you just didn't come waltzing in 
By the way, I'm not saying this so that you guys start wearing uh, ties and uh, suits here to Seaside Community Church. Um, but these people were dressed in a way that just identified them, okay? as like, oh, that's the high priest, and they're living to represent and honor God. And I think the Bible, I don't think, I know the Bible tells us what, how we are to clothe ourselves as priests living in our day. And it's by a considerate lifestyle. These pre, uh, sons of Levi were self-centered. They were abusing their position, abusing power over people, taking the sacrifice meat, sleeping with the gals that were there serving in the temple. They were just power-hungry, self-indulgent, self-centered, selfish people. And God is calling us to a different kind of a life. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1, it says, You should imitate me just as I imitate Christ. He is our ultimate goal, that we would look at his life and say, Man, that is how true humanity is supposed to live out. But it's lived out through you, a unique you. But Jesus is the example. In Acts chapter 11, I love this. And, uh, sometimes we just take for granted that the word Christians, you know, that, that's a name that we just put on ourselves. The word Christian was put on these followers of Jesus because they were what? They were acting like Christ. Oh, those are Christ-like. They're Christians, okay? It was a name that was put on them by the outside world. It wasn't a group of Christ followers that said, hey, I, let's, let's get together and come up with a rad name, you know, a cool name, a name that might stick for the next 2,000 years. This was a name given to them. They are Christ-like. They are followers of Jesus, and their life shows it. In Romans chapter 13, verse 14, it says, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ, and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the flesh. And we are told over again and again to clothe ourselves. There's garments, these garments that we put on, these priestly garments, and it's not outward, it's inward stuff. I'll close with this verse in Colossians. It says, So chosen by God for this new life of love, Dress in the wardrobe God picked out for you. You guys ready for it? This is your Valentine Super Bowl outfit that I want you to put on <laughs> before you leave these doors today. Here it is. Put on this wardrobe, because this is Christ-like. Put on compassion. Put on compassion. Yeah, do I feel something serves in me for the needs of other human beings. Put on kindness. That's compassion's acting. Put on humility. Put on quiet strength. Put on discipline. Be even-tempered, content with second place. Sons of Eli were just seeking power over people and Jesus says man that is not the way to live that is not the way I have intended humanity to be quick to forgive an offense forgive as quickly and completely as the master the great high priest forgave you regardless of what else you put on Wear love. It's your basic, all-purpose, priestly garment. And never be without it. How's that for a priestly garment? Seaside, we represent the most high God. How are we doing with that? How is my life? How am I doing? Great questions to ask. And Father, I thank you so much for... This beautiful seaside family, may you clothe each and every one of us with Christ himself and that we would be priests, your sons and daughters that represent you and 
honor you and please you with our lives so that others may see and know that you live amongst us and in us and you have given us this incredible grace and forgiveness. Thank you so much. In the name of Christ and everybody said, amen. amen. Let's stand and close uh, some little singing here together.
God has always been king. He's always been at work. He's the only one that can clean up humanity's mudslide with his son, Jesus. And he's here today. Maybe you might be living in your own mud pit. God wants to clean you up, restore your life, make you his priests. And it's a good thing. So I'm looking out at a bunch of incredible-looking priests of the Most High King. Go and represent. <laughs> 